인터넷이 웹 컨텐츠와 검색 엔진을 결합해서 우리의 삶을 굉장히 변화시켰습니다. 앞으로는 급증하고 있는 데이터를 통해 가지고 빅데이터 사이언스 분야에서 우리의 삶이 또한번 변혁될 거라고 기대하고 있습니다. 버클리 로렌스 버클리 내셔널 랩에 있는 우리 캐서린 옐릭 교수님 사이언스 랩의 부소장이신데 오늘 강연에서 바이올로지 머티리얼 사이언스 그리고 우주론에서 여러 분야에서 나오고 있는 방대한 데이터를 가지고 이 데이터를 어떻게 준비하고 있는지 이 데이터를 이용해서 어떤 머신에서 활용할 수가 있는 것인지 그리고 앞으로 필요한 컴퓨팅 용량은 얼마가 될 건지 이러한 분야에 대해서 저희들에게 인투이션을 주실 거라고 기대를 하고 있습니다. Let's welcome the Professor Catherine Yellick. Thank you very much. Um, I'm also very honored to be asked to come and speak to all of you. Um, and uh, I, it sounded like it was a very nice introduction. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, I'm going to talk today about the convergence of data and high performance computing. And um, I will start with a little bit of history, although not nearly as much history as we just heard. Um, but this is a history, a little bit of science, and how I think science is about to change, is going through a transformation. So this is our old school view of what a scientist looked like, a single individual who thought really hard about problems and worked on their own um, and probably had all of the tools kind of um, that they needed um, to work on this. And um, we now see much larger teams of scientists working to build high performance computing applications um, and to build big experiments and things like that. But I think we're now seeing an even bigger trend which is towards um, you know, different kind of scientists and the ability of everybody, um, kind of the democratization, if you will, of science. This is a picture of a 17-year-old uh, named Brittany Wagner, um, and this is, I think, now a more common theme, and maybe some of you younger folks in the audience had high school science fairs projects like this. I can tell you mine was nothing like this. Um, she did this project when she was in high school and, you, and developed a, a breast cancer detection tool that was uh, much more effective than what they had been using and it was uh, using a mini minimally invasive um, test that they could provide. And um, she did that by using machine learning. So I assume she borrowed her parents' credit card and bought some time on a cloud. Um, and then she um, learned about machine learning, taught herself enough programming, and then developed this tool. And I think this is a, an increasingly common story that we hear in um, of different people being able to do science with um, access to online computing, understanding machine learning, and access, by the way, to very large data sets, which she also used. Um, the other thing that has changed is even in experimental science, and this is just a, um, a particular website for a, a lab that you can go and outsource your mouse experiments. So as computer scientists, um, most of us are not familiar with such things, but it turns out that not only can you outsource your computing, but you can outsource your experiments in many cases. And um, so this is a, a, um, a lab that you can say, you know, please give the, the uh, you know, a hundred mice a particular medication, for example, see what happens to them given, and have another hundred mice that are control group. If you want to control, you're not quite sure you have confidence in a particular remote lab, um, so you don't have to be there for these experiments to be performed, um, you can, and you can, hi, you can uh, contract with multiple labs to do the experiments to make sure that you get um, high quality results out. So this is really changing the nature of the way science is done, that the ability to sort of outsource both the computing and, the, um, and the, uh, um, some of the experimental work as well. The other thing that is changing is um, the data rates and the growth of the data sizes that we're seeing in science. I think until um, about 10 years ago, for many scientific domains, and there were a few exceptions, for example, in higher, higher energy physics, most of, of the scientists were able to analyze their experimental data on their own. That is, they would have um, their own laptop or their desktop machine back in the day, and they would, um, and some of it was analyzed, of course, originally with paper and pencil, um, but in the case of um, the, even these experiments, such as uh, um, these various kinds of uh, data sets they were collecting from, um, from sequencers and detectors. They had their own small cluster that they were able to use. Um, this is a, a notional graph that I put together a number of years ago that just shows the historical growth rate of 
data rates that are coming from detectors. So these are in things like um, the light sources in the experimental facilities in the, at the, in the US, the particle detectors, and it also, and then the genome sequencers is the yellow line, and um, the processors performance. That was, this is back, by the way, when Moore's Law was still doing pretty well. Um, so that was processor performance, and of course you might say, well, these are data intensive problems, so I don't care about computing performance, but you certainly do care about memory, and the memory um, is the lowest level um, curve there. So where do we see big data sets in science? Um, well, we certainly see a lot of images coming from cosmology, um, from these other kind of experimental devices, such as uh, light sources. We see text um, in all the papers that all of us write. Um, we see genomics data, um, signal processing data. This is an example of a carbon sensor um, data out in the world where we're collecting information about carbon in the atmosphere. Um, we see relationships between groups of people or between groups of animals or plants or whatever that form graphs. And of course, in the HPC community, we produce a lot of data from simulations. And so all of these things can become large-scale data analysis problems. Um, the word AI comes up, and in fact, at Berkeley next week, we're having a very large meeting on AI for science. Um, although, strictly speaking, what we're, we're not necessarily doing artificial intelligence in the classical sense. We are not just trying to create computer software combined with data that give you human-like behavior, whether it's robotics or self-driving cars or speech uh, recognition or speech translation, which would have been very useful for me earlier today. Um, <laughs> But instead, what, you're, what we're trying to do is to look at these instruments that go well beyond what the human eye can see um, and the human senses can detect. Um, this is a picture of um, data from a cryo-EM uh, facility. On the left-hand side, um, whoops, on the left-hand side here, um, this is what the data resolution looked like before 2013. The detectors have improved so much that what the data looks like today is you can see much more detailed um, structure. These cryo um, electron microscopy systems are built by, uh, are used for things like um, biological data and other, other applications. And some of those detectors were actually built at Lawrence Berkeley National Lab. Um, and so the, the point of this is just as one example that we're not just trying to create human-like behavior using machine learning and data analytics and things, we're trying to create superhuman behavior by making scientists, by empowering scientists to solve problems that they can't really solve on their own. So I'm going to talk a little bit about machine learning. Um, it, of course, does uh, combine with uh, um, large-scale data. Um, what can machine learning do? Well, you might say, well, it can find cats on the internet. It can play games like the game of um, Go. It can um, generate faces of celebrities. Um, and it can um, talk to you um, with the things like tools like Siri. So um, OK, well, that's not very interesting for science. OK, these are, these are interesting applications, but maybe not what we care about in science. Um, so I'm going to look at some examples of what they can actually do in science. Um, but the point is, what are the three ingredients that you need um, to make machine learning work? The first one is you need very large data sets. In many cases, you need labeled data sets, or at least some, number, uh, some amount of data that's labeled so that you can use supervised learning. Um, and what do we have in science? Well, we have some um, data sets that are very complicated. Um, what's shown here is a picture of the cosmic microwave background, um, but we're, we're going to look at some other data sets that come from simulations, for example, that are even much more, much more complex. We have, um, we, we, you need algorithms, so you need things like um, stochastic gradient descent or other algorithms. This is actually uh, a picture of a mixed-scale convolutional neural net that was developed by the camera project at Berkeley Lab, um, which is a more efficient way to do um, some of these for, uh, convolutional neural nets for certain kinds of data that passes information between the layers more efficiently. And the last thing that you need is a lot of computing. And of course, in the HPC community, we have a lot of computing. This is a picture of the, of the supercomputer named Corey at uh, the NERSS Supercomputing Center at Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory. So just to give a few science examples, um, this is a picture of Saul Perlmutter. Um, he is a Nobel laureate, um, and he won his Nobel Prize for understanding the accelerating expansion of the universe. Um, it was based on the idea of detecting supernova and using ex these exploding stars, or supernova, to um, measure the expansion of the universe. And I won't go into the mathematical details or anything of it, um, partly because I'm not a cosmologist, but um, to look at the data that this, this community has used, back in the 90s, they were looking at tens of images each night. 
And um, scientists would just look at those images and say, do I think there's an exploding star in that image right there? And they would analyze that and figure out, then they would, they would use that for um, kind of these markers in the, uh, in the universe. Um, in the 2000s, the data set started to grow and they started to use crowdsourcing. In, the eight, in 2018, they, by, by then they were getting tens of millions of images a, a night. And these images actually flow from some of the big telescopes in the US to the NERSS supercomputing center where machine learning algorithms automatically detect supernova explosions. So that's a fairly kind of straightforward, if you will, application of machine learning. Um, but scientists are not just about finding things inside of images or detectors or whatever. They're looking at um, other data sets. They're looking to explain why things happen. And so there's a group of people also looking at using simulations of cosmological um, phenomena, so looking at the formation of the early universe and using machine learning to accelerate the simulation. So what has happening here is they're very expensive, very detailed simulations of the universe. Um, they build a reduced uh, order surrogate model in order to come up with a, more, a faster way to test different configurations of the simulations and figure out which ones they actually need to do a high fidelity simulation of. They're also using um, deep learning to improve the estimation of the cosmological constants. So many different applications of machine learning here. And these codes, uh, by the way, Cosmoflow is one of them. It was built on top of TensorFlow by a group at, at NERSC, and they, um, they've used it for very large-scale training. Um, of course, climate change is another big application and, um, of, uh, of, 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 of HPC. And I was hoping to maybe see a video here. I forgot there was a video embedded in this, but this is looking at hurricane season. Um, so what do we get out of this kind of simulation data? We get very complicated data sets that have in higher dimensions. So 3D, 4D, sometimes adaptive um, data or unstructured data that comes from the simulations. Um, so how do we use machine learning on this data? Well, we can take the ideas from the convolutional neural nets and, and looking for cats, by the way, on the internet and kind of look at an analogy. But I want to point out that the, the data that you're looking at is not two-dimensional images, although that's what it looks like on the screen. What we're looking at is, is many variables and a three-dimensional space of a climate model. So what are the, some of the different machine learning problems that we can solve? Well, the first one is classification. So we can say, is there a cat in this picture? And, or, and we can look at the bottom picture and say, or the bottom simulation and say, is there a hurricane in that simulation? Um, can we I kind of draw a box around where the cat is? Can we localize it? Um, can we localize the hurricane? Um, if we've got a bunch of different kinds of phenomena, a bunch of different kinds of objects, can we detect what each one of them is and tell which one is different than the other? So one dog and two cats and one duck. Um, or in the bottom, we're looking at atmospheric rivers, which produce a lot of rain on the, in the California um, coast over the last uh, 10 years or so. And, um, and then hurricanes, so differentiating between different kinds of extreme climate events. And then can we do se segmentation? So can we um, draw a really detailed line around each of these um, in both cases? Um, and the group also at NERSE that has used this kind of deep learning for these extreme weather events using an adaptive version of these convolutional neural nets um, applied to climate modeling data. This was one of the Gordon Bell finalists last year at supercomputing. It ran over an exaop um, using 16-bit arithmetic. Um, another example from science is, comes with uh, in material science, and um, of course we use the HPC systems a lot for simulating materials where we're looking at the atomic structure and we're trying to figure out where the electrons are going to go and what they're going to do um, in a particular kind of con configuration. Um, so what they're doing now is trying to then interpret a large database of these simulations to figure out kind of what is the relationship between the, the placement of the, um, of the atoms and, and what, what their configuration looks like and how they're going to behave. And what you're seeing on the left is um, an image that's being rotated and that what it looks like in the filtered output from a convolutional neural net. And the surprising thing, at least to me, was that these convolutional neural nets are not rotationally invariant. That is, if I turn the image, the output of the CNN changes. So this is not a very good thing for molecules because not only do you turn molecules um, in two dimensions, but you turn, rotate them in three dimensions. And so what this group is doing, so Tess Smith, who's one of our um, postdocs, is they've trained it, and she's been working with people at Google, has trained it with what looks like Tetris blocks of different shapes to show that a given one of these shapes, 
um, even in many different orientations is the same shape, and then you use that trained network um, applied to molecular structures to make sure that you maintain rotational invariance. So what does it, all of this mean if you're a computer scientist? Well, um, it means, first of all, that we need to adapt our machine learning techniques that are being used in artificial intelligence applications to much more complex scientific data sets. Um, but there's some other challenges that I wanted to talk about as well. Um, and the first one is explainability. And this goes back to the point I made uh, in cosmology about the fact that scientists are not just about finding correlations between things. Um, they're really about explaining the nature of, of how things behave and why they behave in the way they do, coming up with models for them that are, um, that are things that we can understand as human beings. And um, so one, if, if you're just placing advertisements um, for hotels or whatever on a website, you don't really care why a particular hotel is ranked in a certain case, what, what is the underlying mechanism for that. You only care that it, that it gives you a good result. So you care about accuracy, you don't necessarily care about explainability. Um, so things like convolutional neural nets and other deep learning techniques um, tend to give you very good learning performance. That's the accuracy, and that's what you care about. If all you care about is, for example, making money out of the correlations between things. But if you care about explaining them, you want to understand the underlying mechanism. And in a, in a deep neural network, you may have millions of parameters that are learned throughout the um, training process, and you can't really understand why each one, you know, what it means and how it, it all fits together. So coming up with methods that are more explainable is very important. I'll just point out that correlation is not causation. So this is two different data sets um, that look like they're very, they are very highly correlated. Um, and so you might think, well, there probably is a relationship between the two. So what are these two data sets? This is the per capita cheese consumption um, and the number of people who died by becoming entangled in their bed sheets. So I think we would have a very strong human intuition that those two things are not related to one another, even though they happen to be correlated when you look at the statistical statistics of them. Um, I, I also have kind of a cautionary tale going back to the example of carbon sensors. So um, Deb Agarwal and her group at the lab have been working on these projects that, that collect all of the data from carbon sensors that are spread around the world. Um, so Fluxnet and Ameriflux, for example, and these are some pictures of them. And they were, um, and, and what, one of the things that she mentioned to me years ago is one of the problems they have is birds come and drop things on their sensors, and when that happens, there's a big spike in the signal that comes from the sensor. So one of the things that her team does is to literally clean the data. So you have to go through the data and try to remove those spikes because those are not really good measurements. Um, and so I think it's, uh, it's one of the big data analytics problems that we have. But there's a cautionary tale here because there's another group of people that were uh, uh, affected by birds dropping things on their sensors years ago, and that's a picture of Arnie Opensia, Arno Penzias and Robert Wilson, um, and this was the, the team that discovered the cosmic microwave background. But the first two times that they looked at these sets of data that were coming from their, um, their, tel their um, ground uh, micro microwave telescope, they, they were... Um, they, they noticed these signals and they thought that they were coming from the pigeons that were dropping things on the, them. And so they, um, they, they went and cleaned them off and they went and cleaned them off and got rid of the pigeons and they kept seeing this signal and it turned out that this was actually a blueprint of the Big Bang, right? This was, there was information about the history of the universe in here. So you can imagine that if we're not careful about how we use machine learning, we could have just thrown out the data that turned out to be the important signal. In fact, they almost threw out the data um, themselves as well. Okay, so that's um, one of the challenges. Another one is to continue growing computing performance. And this is something that um, I think you are all familiar with in HPC, that there's more and more demand for the computers. Um, this is just looking at HPC for machine learning. And um, the thing that was interesting to me, this is a, a graph that was put together by OpenAI. And it looks, like the, it looks at the amount of, the number of operations, so this is not flops per second, this is the number of actual floating point operations required to train one of these um, neural nets. So they compared something like AlexNet um, back in 2011 with AlphaGo Zero in 2018. And uh, 2017, and at that between those two data points, the amount of computing required to train a neural net grew by a factor of 300,000. 
Um, and in comparison, the top 500 list grew by a fact, less than a factor of 10 in that, that time period. So you can see how the, the need for large amounts of computing, um, and as I've given you a couple of examples of even using supercomputers to do this kind of um, le machine learning training is going to be a very important. And of course, um, we are at the end of Moore's Law scaling, and um, this is a, a slide, a picture from um, Dave Patterson and John Hennessy's Turing Award presentation, which they labeled the um, golden age of computer architecture research. This is the, the sad story of the end of Moore's Law scaling is, of course, a happy story if you're a computer architect because now there are many, many problems to solve in order to try to get computers to go faster in spite of the fact that the transistor density is not going to be improving. So they called this the golden age of computer architecture research. And I would, um, and we already heard earlier today um, in the Barefoot Networks talk about all of these specialized processors, um, and so th th these are, I'm sure, all very familiar to you, including things like the Tensor Processing Unit for specifically doing um, deep learning applications. Um, and a real question for us in science is going to be whether the, the commercial community in architecture is going to go so far towards deep learning that we no longer have the building blocks we need to build the scientific computers we need for simulation. Because although deep learning and, and other kinds of machine learning will be very important in science, um, it will not replace the need for simulation. So um, the next challenge is um, programming these things. And of course, if you're going to build specialized architectures, um, and um, it, we, we heard about the, the difficulty of even, I know that the science community went through in looking at uh, massively parallel machines versus vector machines, which were much easier to use. But now we're talking about specialized processors that are going to change with each, um, with each generation of hardware, so much more difficult to deal with. I mean, this is an example of a, um, a problem, a science problem, if you will, or actually a medical problem, which is analyzing MRI data, and how uh, one of my former students, uh, Michael Driscoll, addressed this problem using a domain-specific language on uh, GPU hardware and other kinds of, uh, of hardware accelerators. So this is looking at, um, the problem is that when you're doing an MRI, especially on a small child, you want to get them out of the MRI machine in about three minutes. So I don't know how many of you have had MRIs in this room, but it's, um, it's very noisy and, a little, and pretty claustrophobic. People really don't like to sit in them very long. And um, for an adult, you may be able to convince yourself to do it, but for a child, it's very challenging. So the question was, could they get the, the um, the uh, MRI time down to three minutes. And it turns out that they can put more detectors inside of the MRI machine and they can collect all this data, but now they need new algorithms for putting the data together. And this is some uh, algorithmic work by Mickey Lustig at um, UC Berkeley and his, his team looking at, um, at developing a new algorithm for this. So what Michael did was to build a domain-specific language, and it was built on the idea of matrices as kind of the, the building blocks, the core variables, if you will, both general sparse matrices and then very important other matrices that come up in practice in, in analyzing the MRI data, um, and then using a, um, a language in which you can compose these, sorry, can, you can compose these together um, by using... Um, different product matrix products, for example, sparse matrix times an FFT matrix times another two other sparse matrices. But it, you retain semantic properties of the matrices, which allow you to automatically generate very efficient code. And I won't show, talk about this slide in detail, just except, except to say that it runs very efficiently on both um, on standard CPUs as well as the, the um, Xeon Phi, and, um, but even better on GPUs. So um, what is the, the next problem I want to talk about in, da in data analysis is the problem of irregular data structures. So in physical simulations, for the most part, what we're doing is we're putting a regular mesh around a domain. So you put it around the earth, you put, um, and you may have particles as well, um, but you typically have a lot of very regular data structures, even when you end up with hierarchical methods. Um, in data analysis problems, we often have very unstructured data. That is, there is structure in the data, but we don't know what it is in advance. And that's exactly the point of the data analysis problem. So this is a problem of um, what's, what's called genome assembly. Um, and the problem is, given a, a set of DNA that's coming out of a genome sequencer, how can you put it together to reconstruct the chromosomes? So if you're not familiar with the way the sequencers work, current technology spits out fragments of DNA and, by the way, inserts errors into them along the way. So what do you do about this? Well, you, you read the DNA multiple times, 
um, and then you have multiple copies of every position in the DNA, and you put it together like you're putting together a puzzle. Um, but for those of you who like puzzles, um, you know there's a big difference between putting together a puzzle if you know what the cover looks like. That would be like the human DNA. So we know what it looks like. You can kind of take a piece and say, I think it goes about here because of the colors in it or something. In DNA, you can do the same thing. You say, here's a pattern. It looks like it might belong here or maybe in one other place in the human genome. What we're interested in is what's called metagenome assembly, where you're assembling the genomes of microbial species, so bacteria and fungi and things like that, where you don't have any reference because we don't know what these kinds of species look like, what their DNA looks like. So we're doing it then without the cover. But in addition, in a metagenome scenario, what happens is you scoop up some soil and you sequence that soil, and what you have maybe uh, thousands of different, different species all mixed together in the soil. So think of this problem as taking a whole bunch of puzzles, 100 different puzzles, and dumping all their pieces together on the floor. Don't look at any of the covers of the boxes, and now you have to reassemble that. So it's a hard computational problem. There is structure in it, right? There's, there's these chromosomes that are sitting in there, but you don't know what they are when you start. So you take what are called the reads, that is the output of the sequencers, um, you chop them into even smaller pieces, you throw out ones that don't occur frequently enough because that means that they probably contained an error. So you have, to have, you have multiple copies of every, every place in the, in the genome. Um, and so you throw out anything any that doesn't have multiple copies. Um, then you try to put these little things together in what is a depth-first graph traversal, but you've represented the graph as a hash table because you store those fragments in a hash table. And you do some other things. You do genome alignment. By the way, the data in this case is four characters, so great opportunities for specialized architectures because you have A, C, T, and G. You can use two-bit wide data types um, for some of these when you get to these alignment problems and so on. And there's some other pieces of the um, pipeline that fit in here as well. So we use something, and those of you familiar with my past research will recognize the idea of a partition global address space language. Um, the interesting thing about building a hash table is it's fairly awkward to try to write that in a send receive model because you want to send something to a processor that owns a bucket of the hash table, but that processor, the software on that processor doesn't have any information about the fact that there's an incoming key, um, an incoming fragment from DNA that's going to be added to their part of the hash table. So it's very useful to be able to have a put and a get operation, which, is, which are the primitives in a PGAS language, uh, a partition global address space language, rather than having a send and receive, because the, uh, you want to put it into the memory of the other processor, not ask the other processor to coordinate with you and accept it. Um, so we also do some automatic aggregation, which we also heard about in the Barefoot Networks talk, but this happens in the HPC network. Um, we get very good scaling of this code, um, at least relative to what they had. When we started with this application, it was actually only ran on a single shared memory node, and so it runs now um, many times faster than it did before. And we can assemble data sets such as um, environmental data sets that are uh, multiple terabytes and were impossible to assemble before in their entirety. So it's really about not just making problems run faster, but making problems sol uh, solvable that you couldn't solve before. Um, just to kind of look at the underlying communication layer, um, why is it a little bit different than in a send and receive model? Um, here is the, um, the idea of a send and receive message versus a one-sided message that comes up in a partition global address space model. Um, so in the case of the send and receive operation, the data that you're sending comes with a message ID. So in the, the, in the implementation of MPI, there's a message ID that's going to get matched with um, a receive operation that is executed by the host processor over here. So in order to figure out what to do with this data, you have to somehow get information from the CPU on the other side. Whereas in a one-sided message, it contains the address, so the network interface and any, inf and any network interface with RDMA support will be able to directly write that into memory. Um, very useful in um, building these hash tables and looking things up in hash tables, um, although you also want some, some memory atomics, and that's one of the things that we're talking with the vendors about is making sure it's possible um, to atomically, for example, increment something or add a, add a pointer to something on the other side. So um, the, the last two challenge that I'll talk about in some detail is um, looking at algorithms. Um, what is the most expensive thing you do on any kind of a computer? Anybody? Um, well, it's da it move data around, right? And it's the most expensive thing you do in terms of the time it takes, which is what this picture shows. Um, so moving data around um, from disk to um, solid state disk, which is much better, still a big gap to DRAM, but down here um, is the uh, 
the, the number of cycles required to access something that's on the CPU chip versus in an SRAM versus in a DRAM, and notice this is a log scale, so there's huge differences. And that, that's very familiar to any of you who've optimized MPI codes or any other kind of parallel codes. You really want to reduce the amount of communication, but you also want to do it within the local memory hierarchy and reduce the amount of data movement that goes out to, to DRAM, for example. Um, and it turns out that this is also where most of the energy goes in a computer system is moving data around um, between these different levels. So um, there's some techniques that, are, that we can use for reducing communication. At a very high level, um, the two general themes are reducing the bandwidth. That's the best thing you can do in some sense, which is to reduce the total volume of data that's going to be sent around the system, either sent up and down the memory hierarchy or between the processors on a parallel machine. The second thing you do is reduce latency. What, we mean by that, what I mean by that is reducing the total number of messages. Very common technique in MPI, for example, is to pack your data together so you send fewer messages because each message has a cost associated with it, um, which is not just the bandwidth cost. Um, and so I'm going to give a couple of examples from machine learning, both a graphical model one from um, traditional machine learning and then a deep learning idea, a deep learning method. And um, to give you some intuition, I'm going to talk about dividing up the iteration space rather than just dividing up the data. So in, a, in physical simulations that we're very familiar with on HPC, a very common thing to do is to take the, the grid, for example, that you're computing on and divide it up over the processors. Here we want to think about, um, it turns out that's not optimal for some of these kinds of problems, and let me give one example um, to talk about that. So this is going to be a, an example from maybe our favorite problem in HPC, which is dense matrix multiply. And um, what does dense matrix multiply look like? It's got three nested loops, I, J, and K. And um, we can look at this as then the iteration space, which is a cube. So inside of that cube, at every point is a little multiply operation that you're using to update the C matrix. The C matrix um, is uh, indexed by I and J. So you can think of the C matrix as being on the floor, either the top or the floor. Um, and you can think of the, um, the A and B matrix then as the um, faces on the uh, the front and the side. So the C matrix is the top shown here um, because that's the I and J indices. Okay, so now the question is, for any point in that interior, what data do I need to do that computation? Well, I can take that point and project it up onto the C matrix. That's where I'm going to be updating the C matrix. I can project it forward um, onto the A matrix that says what value of A do I need, and I can project it sideways to, what, to say what value of B do I need. So the question is, how do I divide up this iteration space in order to minimize the total amount of data that I need, um, which is really equivalent to saying, how do I divide that up in such a way that there's some glob in the middle that I'm going to compute, and I reduce the size of the projection on each of those faces. And so that's one of the techniques we, we use is this geometric model, and we use it to prove lower bounds, that is, the necessary requirements in communication that are inherently um, required in order to do a computation, as well as um, inspire us in terms of better algorithms. So, it turns out that dividing up the C matrix, which is probably the most natural way to think about parallelizing matrix multiply, let's say distributed memory, you give each processor a block of the C matrix and you cycle the pieces of A and B around until everyone sees, all the processors see the, um, all the input they need to, to compute their own piece of it. That is actually not the optimal way to do it in terms of communication. It's better to um, divide it into things that are more like square, um, equal size cubes on the interior, which means you're going to have to do a reduction in the direction of the C matrix. Um, now, matrices come up all over the place in machine learning, so this is not just about physical simulations. Um, and this is a slide put together by Aiden Bulich and a number of others looking at some of these different types of, sparse, of, of um, machine learning techniques um, and whether they use sparse matrices or dense matrices and whether they're doing dense matrix matrix operations, so BLAS3, things that work very well on almost any architecture, hopefully, and um, things that are much more compute intensive, which would include matrix vector multiplication. Um, so this is some work done by one of my students, Penporn Koanantakul, um, looking at sparse matrix, vec dense matrix multiply. And I won't read through this graph except to say along the x-axis are a whole bunch of different configurations of how you divide up the iteration space. So think of that 
dense matrix iteration space that I showed before, except one of those matrices is sparse. The other one is dense, but by the way, it's, it's tall and skinny, so it's not, they're not equal size in terms of their dimensions. And there's lots, and di lots of different communication optimal ways of dividing this up, and that's what, what this graph shows is just how much performance gain you can get um, by looking at uh, these different variations. Um, and this is how she put this into a graphical model estimator, um, and the, the previous best um, high-performance graphical estimator for this problem was um, this line called, um, I have the name of it here, um, oh, Big and, Qu Big and Quick, um, actually also done by a former um, Berkeley graduate student, Indrajit Dillon, um, and, uh, and his graduate students now. And all of these other lines show what happened. And that, the Big and Quick was just a shared memory code. Um, these others show what happens when you run it on multiple nodes. So even on one node, it outperforms big and quick, um, but you can solve much larger problems. So in the same spirit of the genomics problem, it's not just making things run faster, it's being able to analyze data sets that were previously impossible. Um, and she worked with some others to apply this to some um, fMRI data, so functional MRI data for um, understanding the different regions of the brain. Now, um, the last thing I'm going to talk about is often when you're trying to minimize communication in these algorithms, you can't just look at the matrix multiply type kernels or the matrix vector multiplies. You want to look at a higher level algorithm. And what happens when we do something like that in machine learning is um, we might look at batches. So if you're familiar with um, deep learning training, rather than taking one image at a time, we'll take a batch of images and then we can execute that, the um, steps of the convolutional neural net in parallel on our parallel machine. I mean, it gives us much better um, locality and much better reuse of data. So a standard batch size for one of these, um, these algorithms might be um, 512, so 512 images. By the way, out on the outer loop, there's a thing called the epics. That's the number of times you run through the entire data set. So in each of these cases, we'll run through the data set 100 times, but we'll take a certain, we'll, we'll divide up each one of those epics into some steps, which is the number of images in each case, in each batch. So, Clearly, and we're, we're looking here at the, um, the time to compute them, it scales linearly except for the, the communication term, not surprisingly, so everything is embarrassingly parallel in, this, um, in the batch, a, a single batch, except that you have to do some reductions at the end, so you have a log factor in there. Um, so it seems like the obvious thing to do is make much larger batches, not just 512. If you're going to run this on distributed memory, make then 100,000 images per batch. Um, and the problem is, for, the, for numerical reasons that I won't try to explain, and I'm not sure we, we can explain in detail, um, the, the code no longer converges. So this is what happens. Epics is the number of times we run through all of the data. The blue dot is what happens when we use batch sizes of 512, and the black line is what happens when you use uh, much larger batch sizes. And the point of this is, um, oh, by the way, the y-axis here is the accuracy. And so we want the accuracy to improve as we read through the data multiple times. If the accuracy just goes up and down, then we're not converging and nothing good will happen with our algorithm. So it sounds like a great idea to make really large batch sizes, but it actually doesn't work numerically. It turns out that you can recover um, the convergence rate um, by using something called, um, whoops, maybe my animation didn't work here, called LARS, um, which is um, level-specific tuning of the hyperparameters hyper in the convolutional neural net. So I won't try to describe that in detail, but there's a bunch of parameters that control things like the learning rate. Um, there's, these are multiplying and, and uh, factors inside of the machine learning algorithm. So you really need to adjust those in order to get the large batch sizes to converge. And when you do that, you can get um, uh, deep learning training. This is ImageNet in under two minutes, and this is work by Yang Yu um, and uh, Jim Demmel, Kurt Kreutzer, and, and others um, making this, this code scale very effectively, and uh, is something also done with Google and uh, advertised by Google. I think this Lars technique is now a standard technique for some of these big um, contests as well. So um, just to summarize, I wanted to just you know, say, step back and say there is this d data tsunami that's happening in science in general, um, not just in computing. Uh, certainly part of that is coming from computer simulations, but part of that is coming from big experiments, from sequencers, um, from other, other sorts of uh, detectors and so on. Um, distrib distributed data structures of the kind that I talked about in the hash table for the genomics application can be a very important technique for analyzing data that does, where you don't know what the structure is in advance. And that really put, challenges the way we think about algorithms and parallel computing on distributed memory because we want to do random accesses into data structures like a hash table. <clears throat> 
And it allows us, when, when we make that work, by the way, we can then take problems that people thought only ran on shared memory machines and make them run and scale on distributed memory machines. Um, we can use machine learning techniques in a lot of different science domains. There's a huge explosion of interest. We did a survey at the lab uh, a few months ago and we found over 100 projects that were using uh, machine learning of different kinds in their um, different science domains. Um, there is a difference in science, which is, as scientists, our job is not to just find correlations to explain why they exist, and therefore a deep um, learning method, if what we're using that for is to try to, for example, explain the expansion of the universe, not just find whether these two things are supernova or not, um, is, is going to be um, very important, and the, this notion of explainability is, is a real challenge for machine learning techniques like deep learning. Um, I think that um, we're going to continue to need more computing performance. So in addition to simulation, which I didn't talk much about, but is continuing to grow in interest, um, it, there is still, there's an even more interest in using it for data analytics problems and for machine learning problems. And um, to quote uh, Patterson and Hennessy, it's a golden age of architecture research, so lots of opportunities for all of you interested in designing architecture as uh, the benefits of Moore's Law scaling tail off. But if it's a golden um, age for computer architecture, it has to be one for programming models and programming systems research as well, because we need to have languages and compilers that will generate code for these systems. And finally, um, and at least for algorithms, at least machine learning algorithms, there's certainly a golden age as well because there's a lot to do in understanding how to make these algorithms scale efficiently as well as how to make them converge quickly um, based on real data and things like that. So thank you very much and with that I will end.